Hello everyone and welcome back to ADAP, our course on advanced design and programming. This is the second of the main lectures and after talking about uh, methods and functions last session, we will talk about classes, class design, the interfaces and the different types of classes that make up this next larger step away from methods to classes in the design of object-oriented systems. So we have a lot of ground to cover today. Uh, classes versus interfaces, how to think about an interface, how to program to an interface, how to break it down by primitives and so forth. So the first thing to understand obviously is that there is a difference between a class which encapsulates both an interface and some implementation of it as well as the plain interface arguably then a part of a class. But it's a concept in its own right. So when we do that now, we will need to talk about the different interfaces of a class, one of which is the use client interface, where a class, which has methods that combined represent the interface, uh, presents those methods, public methods, to clients to use, which constitutes the use client interface. We will also see that classes have internal interfaces in how composed methods use other composed methods and primitive methods to do their work. So there are internal interfaces not visible to outside clients by which a class does its jobs, job. And finally, there's the inheritance interface which a class defines by way of a set of abstract methods uh, how it wants to be extended by subclasses. And so a class programs against this inheritance interface to delegate work uh, to subclasses or the instances of subclasses, which fill in the holes or the open slots defined by the inheritance interface. Now, when we talk about objects and classes, I really want to drive home the point that there are two separate perspectives that inform how you structure your code and both are relevant, uh, but you really need to have a clear understanding whether you are talking about the real world that you're modeling or whether you're looking at how to efficiently implement something with a computer. So that's the difference between the modeling perspective, representing the real world or the problem domain in code versus efficient implementation, which is the technology perspective. Coincidentally and historically, uh, the modeling perspective has been called the uh, European perspective, mostly mostly driven out of the Scandinavian school and the technology perspective, maybe the American uh, perspective. So the difference is in modeling, an object represents something from the real world or some virtual world or some domain, and a class really captures the commonalities of similar objects, so there's an abstraction process, while in the technology perspective, an object really is just of data uh, encapsulated, protected by methods, where a class then defines those methods, the implementation and the computer executable behavior around the data. Modeling is super important. Arguably, it's more important than the technology perspective. But of course, you can't do without proper implementation and technology. So here we will be going back and forth between it and we are closer to implementation or, impl or technology in this lecture than modeling because I'm making the assumption that you know what you want to model and now the question is how do you turn that into good code. So talking about classes and interfaces, let me clarify that again. Uh, the first concept is an interface uh, to understand. That is really uh, the summary of uh, the behavior of objects that conform uh, to the behavior defined by an interface. Usually that means there are methods, obviously, but uh, somewhat more abstractly and also more precisely, it means that 
um, the interface defines the possible state space for objects that conform to these uh, to this interface as well as the transitions in that state space so the interface expresses what you can query about an object and of course you should only get valid values uh, back when querying uh, an object through its interface and then as you may change the state issue a command method call a command method on the object then you cause a transition possibly in the state space from one valid state to another so the object should never be in an inconsistent state and the way to manipulate an object is through an interface in java and many other programming languages the implementation of an interface is done by classes so that a class then becomes the combination of the interface that it implements and thereby embodies as well as the methods that implement uh, the interface meaning implement the methods from the interface implement the abstract state through concrete state meaning fields uh, of the class uh, for its objects I use the cl term class in general of course there are different types of classes one type of class is an abstract class which is a not complete class it remains abstract in that it leaves some things open so it's a partial implementation of an interface behavior uh, usually it implements the more important stuff leaving other things open for then subclasses which might be further abstract classes or concrete classes to fill in another term uh, I like to use is that it provides algorithmic scaffolding so in an abstract class you might may find combined methods and in particular template methods that implement some complex algorithm but they delegate that method delegates the smaller steps within that algorithm to other methods either other combined or even primitive methods some of which will not be known with an implementation to the abstract class but which will only be provided by subclasses an implementation class then is just that a concrete subclass typically of an abstract class um, sometimes directly of an interface where it completely implements all the required methods to allow for instantiation of that implementation class so you can get a full-fledged object only of a concrete class and implementation class can you get a full-blown object you cannot instantiate an abstract class that's the idea you've got to wait and find a concrete subclass which contains by inheritance and by what it adds to inherited methods a complete implementation both abstract class and implementation class also embody like any class some interface but they also add the implementation to it in Java then we actually have a keyword in the programming language to define uh, to just state an interface without an implementation you just say interface but in addition you also have classes so in Java there's a clear distinction between a class and an interface and a class then either says that it implements an interface so it says I will provide those methods of the interface eventually or it has an implicit interface as shown or provided by the methods it declares even if it, there's a Java class which does not implement a Java interface it still has an interface as demonstrated or as shown by the methods it declared the method it declares even if those are not implementing some interface methods and so each class has its own method uh, interface even if these uh, interface methods come with the method implementation right away so that's of course what java does java classes do add the implementation to the interface right away Java classes can be abstract classes in case of which they do leave some of the uh, implementations open either because they do not implement methods 
taken from an interface or because they declare uh, some methods as abstract and omit a body, an implementation body, etc. So there are different ways of how pragmatically you can make a class an abstract class. But what you should understand is that you should make an abstract class only if you have the intention as declared that you want to delegate some of its implementation to subclasses, which as already indicated and will be discussed later, you do by having an explicit inheritance interface. So first, let's talk about use clients and what objects using other objects through an interface, which is always there, whether it's implicit in a class or explicit through a Java interface, uh, what those see of the object. And that is the abstract state model expressed in the interface. And as separate from some implementation state fields, that are somehow mapped to the abstract state model. So here's a simple abstract state model for sequential files. So the state of a file can be, uh, it has been opened or it has been closed and I allow for deletion here. And um, there's some implicit constraints because I want to constrain this state space which, for example, do not allow for a transition from open to deleted, or we do not allow for a reading or writing when the file is closed. So this is conceptual, this is abstract, and this needs to be expressed in an interface. And then how you implement it by way of fields in objects, implemented uh, objects of classes implementing uh, an interface that represents this abstract state model is a second uh, step. So here's how it could look like. You have some query methods, Boolean query methods. Is it open? Is it closed? And of course you have read and write methods and uh, delete method. So this could be an interface in case of which there would be no implementation body behind these methods, or it can be the interface of the class uh, with an implementation body, but nevertheless, it's an interface that hides an implementation state and expresses an abstract state. The abstract state here is extracted on the left into an interface. You don't have to do that. Uh, you don't always need to declare explicit interfaces, but I'm doing it here right now to make it very clear. Uh, now, I have taken these, um, uh, the state information, is the file empty, is it, has it been opened and declared it, made it visible to use clients by way of explicit query methods. There is no implication here that an implementation of this interface has to have a Boolean field uh, called is, is empty. Um, indeed, if you look to the right to a method to a class with an implementation of the is empty method, I chose a way of implementing it and representing the state which does not contain a Boolean field is empty. I just check whether the length of the file is zero. So there is no guarantee that if in an abstract state, there appears to be a Boolean value that you have a Boolean field in the implementation. That's the difference between an abstract state and an, impl and an implementation state. You need to get clear about that and that you have a mapping between that. And often the abstract state is more elaborate than the implementation state. So then, uh, I now want to talk about an important rule of good design and programming, which is called, uh, the rule is called program to an interface, not to an implementation. So the idea is that a programmer here, uh, meaning someone who, in general, but right now someone who is a use client, implements a class that uses 
objects of other classes. You should always be programming against the declared interface of the class or explicit interface and should not rely on anything you might know about its implementation. Do not rely on knowing that there is no is empty field. Just don't do it. Rely only on the interface. And so that is this rule. And of course, the goal is to make your code more easily changeable, more easily maintainable or evolvable. So as you so let me elaborate a little bit on this principle and then you will see why it makes your code more uh, maintainable. If you program to the interface, you rely on the abstract state model. That's what the modeler or the programmer of the class whose instances you're using wants you to rely on. And they can then change, for example, in subclasses or in later versions of the same class, the way how they implement the abstract state model through implementation states. They can change the fields. But if your client code relied on the fields somehow that are there, somehow worked around encapsulation, then you program to the implementation and not the interface, and then your code cannot be changed uh, so easily. That may feel obvious that you should not try to break encapsulation, but it's easier said than done. For example, sometimes you get impatient and you ask, why does the class not have this method? And since I can't change the class, um, let me, well, you can change the class, but the easiest way is just to expose its fields through getters and setters, and then I can implement whatever functionality I need in clients, relying on getters and setters that give me access to the implementation state. Bad idea, you're breaking the abstract state model, it bec your code becomes less easily evolvable. There are other subtle dependencies that you might introduce if you program to the implementation. For example, if you know that there's a certain algorithm which sequentially reads information versus uh, somehow is able to uh, parallelize things, you may start relying on the performance uh, of the algorithms. Will they be fast enough? And if you start doing that, you will depend on those and may get very subtle bugs in your own code based on race conditions you introduce yourself. So do not make assumptions beyond what is stated in the explicit or implicit interface by way of the abstract state model. A class implementation then takes the abstract state model and implements it. So the concrete implementation class usually is where eventually the actual fields are implemented that map the abstract state into data in an object. And um, that's where ultimately, of course, the implementations end but it's not what the use clients uh, should see. Um, and such implementation can, of course, be spread over multiple classes, abstract superclasses and concrete implementation classes. So now we talked about use client interfaces, what clients see, how um, there should be an abstract state model of what that shows what valid states of objects conforming to the interface are and what state transitions in that state space are possible and how that is separate from how a concrete implementation class turns that into fields that it implements methods with to satisfy the abstract state model. So the question is, how do we use those internal, encapsulated, not accessible to use clients uh, fields? And how do we implement uh, functionality? And here is, uh, there is one important rule uh, called design by primitives, uh, which tells you that you should break down your use client facing uh, methods and functions 
in steps from the uh, uh, combined uh, or template methods that a use client may call, you should break it down into smaller combined methods and eventually primitive methods like we already discussed in the previous section. So primitive methods um, are the uh, smallish methods that encapsulate themselves, the implementation state, so they usually wrap around the fields and uh, do uh, the small stuff around those fields. And then if you defined an effect efficient implementation state that ultimately can satisfy the abstract state space, must be able to hold all possible state, um, then you wrap primitive methods around that and you design your classes by letting all composed uh, combined methods end with those primitives. So starting with a call chain at the interface of some template or combined composed method, you have a chain of calls from composed to composed to composed and eventually to primitive methods, which are the leaves of the call chain or call tree or the end of it. And so those then are the effective final encapsulators of the implementation state. And you should not change the implementation state outside of those primitive uh, methods. And what they are really good at is um, still is abstracting away because you're hiding the actual implementation state so that you can vary it by way of inheritance interfaces and provide different variations of it in subclasses. So it's not that there is a one-to-one -one corresponding between primitive methods and an implementation field, or some field of the class, but it's still an internal intermediate uh, logical layer of fields that are possibly implemented in different ways by subclasses. So what I just explained as designed by primitives will nicely correlate and lead to the inheritance interface which we will be discussing in a bit. So here is uh, how design by primitives could look like for an insert method, going back to the previous example of our name classes. Remember the homogeneous names. Uh, a name like dub 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 jvalue.org is a homogeneous name, three components dub 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 and jvalue and org and uh, a delimiter char character, the uh, period in between those, like domain names, are examples of homogeneous names. So you might want to be able to insert a new component um, in there. So you give it at an index i, you want to insert the component uh, c. And we see a, com a composed method here, which um, at the top, which um, contains some initial checking, assertion methods, then uh, to allow for exit checking post conditions, it uh, saves some data, and then calls out to a primitive method called do insert. Primitive methods by naming convention often start with do or basic, etc. also as explained in a previous class. Now, this is a composed method uh, that is public, meaning facing use clients. Uh, some outside object can call insert on the homogeneous name object. Only the internal methods now can use though the primitive method do insert. Um, it seems like it really just makes one simple change about the object. However, uh, I have implemented it here and as you can see, it's not at all a trivial, it's not a complex implementation either, but it's much more than just changing a, a field of an implementation state. As you can see, the do insert method here, which is a primitive method, has a not so primitive implementation by which it really uses still other methods uh, to insert, to, to move out of the way the components after the index to make room for the new component and then insert insert 
the new component there. Now, um, you're right to say that this looks rather complex, but the reason is that this is a highly inefficient implementation, but it is an implementation. Uh, usually, to get going, you simply want one implementation and then you can improve on it later. It should be obvious that this is not an efficient implementation. But conceptually, insert, uh, after checking for all the preconditions, add some index i or index a component c. Uh, that is a primitive uh, method from the perspective of a homogeneous name. And as we will see, there are, um, uh, are other ways of implementing it. So, um, uh, but let me do a, a, give another example in the form of a quiz here. Let's consider a set component method. Public facing, it's part of the interface, use client facing. So again, you do assertion checking and then you call a, what you might think is a primitive method and is a primitive method here called set component. So like insert component, except that it just overrides what it finds at the index i. Now, as a primitive method, it has to be implemented. Um, could use implementation state, but like in the previous example, I decided to give a generic implementation. I just insert the component um, at the location and then I remove the component that follows afterwards because that's the one that should get replaced. And so I do implement the primitive to set component method. It is an implementation. It's even more inefficient than the previous one, but hey, you get running code and you can improve it. So my point here again is you think about your class, all the fancy things you might want to do with homogeneous names, uh, whatever, have some permutations computed, but on a primitive level, it's really insert, set, uh, remove, get, and that's it. Even though these are logically primitives, you can give them complex implementations, but knowing that we designed well, meaning they are primitive methods, we can have competing alternative implementations to which I will come in a bit. So far, there was no talk about abstract classes or inheritance. And so I want to stay with that but um, then move on to uh, go beyond that. Here again, you see the homogeneous name and it's a class with the full-blown interface. Um, I'm showing all methods here, use case, use client facing, so public methods, internal methods, those for the inheritance interface and so forth. The key here is as you design software systems, you should not overdo it. Your first step is simply to have one class. Um, the full state, it gets lengthy perhaps, but you really need one class. In that class, you have everything in one module, so to speak. You have the, again, interfaces, the different interfaces. You also have the implementations for it, and maybe that's wholly sufficient. Um, here you can see the implied interface of that class. And uh, I say implied interface because it's still a simple class, a single class. And so you can recognize the interface of it, but it has not been pulled out as its own interface. That would be a separate step. Nevertheless, the interface is clearly there. And then we also talk about the class interface. So it's got the whatever conversion or interpretation methods as string. It has the uh, use case, uh, use client facing uh, methods, the public methods, get component, set component, and so forth. Um, it also has the implementation. So in the same package, in the same modular structure, the class, you have not only the interface we just saw, but also the implementation. And um, so we see both public methods for use clients, the remove method in the example here, and then internal methods, 
For example, assert as valid index. This assertion method is an obvious helper method for the implementation of some internal interface. And then the do remove method, a primitive method, also preparing for subclassing. So that is the implementation of what right now still is a simple single class. And again, even though I will be teaching you the full fledged design, I don't want anyone to believe you always need to go full scale and always choose the most complex uh, solution. Having a simple single class like this is often just the best thing because then you have one file with one class and it's comprehensible. As mentioned, this class has uh, various interfaces or categories of interfaces. Again, the use, case, use client interface, uh, public methods, then it has protected methods uh, that constitute the inheritance interface, and then it has methods that are used internally in the implementation of the class, and these are internal interfaces. With a lot of methods, you will eventually have to get a handle on them. An IDE might show them to you using alphabetical lexical ordering. And so you get all the get methods together, all the set methods together, and that may not be so good because you usually want to think logically about your, your class. There's a role, there's a, there's a reason why when you program a class, you put the getter next to the setter. Most people will put getters next to setters because they logically belong together. Uh, they don't create one section of the class where they program all the getters and another section where they program all the setters. Few people would do that. Usually you group um, your methods by uh, some implied structure of the class. So different concerns of the class, the methods belonging to different concerns, also called roles or traits or protocols, you group the methods belonging to these different concerns uh, together. And um, that's why your code is important and why, say, just listing in some browser a linear list alphabetically of your methods is not telling the whole truth about the class. Um, so you usually often have to go to the code actually and not just work with the uh, browsers of an IDE. So I just explained the simple class, which is the complete package. It's got the interface, it's got the implementation. Uh, when I say interface, it's got different types of interfaces, but they are all there and uh, in one neat package. From a code structuring perspective, However, this is, this is fine if the class is small and manageable and you want everything in one place, but eventually uh, you want, it, want to structure it differently if you want to allow for variation. In particular, if you want to have different implementations of the implied or real interface uh, to use clients and uh, you want to make that easily possible without repeating too much code. And for that, you need an inheritance interface. The inheritance interface is how a superclass communicates, defines the communication with its subclasses. Uh, so at runtime, there's only one object of a subclass, but the code that runs uh, when it's in the code is in the superclass, it calls out to methods and using polymorphism or late binding. Uh, some of these method calls will end up in code written by the subclass. And if so, uh, you, that can happen if you just overwrite methods. Um, but it's better if you follow a design by primitives principle and thereby identify the primitive methods, which are the first, uh, first ones to be possibly overwritten or even implemented uh, in subclasses. And so um, the inheritance interface is usually expressed by a set of primitive, by, by the primitive methods, even if an abstract superclass 
uh, has already implementations of these primitive methods. Think back to my highly inefficient do insert do uh, or set do set component methods. Uh, such implementations may be provided by an abstract superclass, but they are so inefficient, they're really thought by the superclass, the abstract class, to be overwritten uh, by subclasses which know how to do better. So um, the inheritance interface then um, relies on design by primitives, and the inheritance interface is a set of methods that the superclass defines for overriding uh, through subclasses. And the superclass often does not want the other methods to be overwritten. Um, and so if you write a class and you randomly override uh, methods you inherit, then probably that superclass doesn't have a good or well-defined inheritance interface. Rather, you look at the superclass in the good case and recognize those methods that have been singled out as constituting the inheritance interface. And you will recognize that these are the primitive methods that do the small basic steps as they are being used by the template and composed methods of the superclass. So this way, um, the superclass class does all its work, relying on the primitives. And the primitives are sometimes are concrete classes. More often they are left abstract because the superclass wants subclasses to implement them. So they are made hook methods so that the subclasses can hook in or provide their own implementation of the primitive methods and thereby complete the class to be a concrete implementation class of which you can have instances, objects, and so forth. So you get a set of methods, primitive methods typically, that constitute the inheritance interface. Uh, if you do it for the first time, you'll probably do it well. Over time you realize Mm, mm, you really want to give, as a designer of the superclass, you really want to speed up any use of the class to make it, make it easy to make the class concrete. So you think even further about your inheritance interface and look at whether some of these hook methods, primitive hook methods, can't, do they really have to be abstract methods? Or could they also have an implementation? And you will try to provide generic, inefficient, but executable implementations, even for the methods in the inheritance interface, meaning that the resulting interface is called narrow inheritance interface because the number of methods a subclass really has to implement to get a concrete implementation is smaller than with a full inheritance interface. So you really try to make it minimal so that whoever comes along and uses the abstract superclass uh, by subclassing it has a very fast way to an executable class to a concrete implementation class. Over time, they may want to override more from the inheritance interface, in particular do away with the inefficient implementation. But in the first round, you're usually just happy if you get the class, your subclass, up and running uh, quickly. So let's look at an example. Um, so far we had this homogeneous name class and it was just a simple single class. Now I want an abstract implementation class with an inheritance interface. And the implication is if I do that, I probably want different implementations with different behavior of the concept of a homogeneous name. And indeed, uh, here are next to the abstract name class in the example on the screen, two different implementation classes, one called string name, the other called string array name, indicating already how they implement the interface differently. The string name class stores the whole homogeneous string in one internal string. So all the components are there in that string name here. And whenever you manipulate the homogeneous name, you've got to find the component in name and then do something with it. 
string array name has a different implementation. It uses a string array. So the components are in different uh, slots in the string array. And so that has requires a different implementation and will obviously have different behavior. Maybe it's already obvious. String name is probably slower because you don't have that indexed access to the components that string array name gives us. But then it's a very efficient, space efficient implementation, while on the right you still need that array and the overhead of that. So string name is slower but needs less memory, and string array name is faster but may need more memory. That's a typical trade off speed versus memory consumption, and that most often gives you two different implementation classes. So here you can see how a string array name would override the do set component method, which is a primitive method, which is part of the inheritance interface of abstract name, but maybe not of the narrow inheritance interface because that would only be insert and remove, do insert and do remove. Um, nevertheless, even though we have that do set component implementation from abstract name, it's so horribly inefficient that string array name, which has a really simple way of implementing it, just overrides it. String array name simply sets the component anew at the index i in the components array where the different name components are. So as you can see, the subclassing implementation is really much more efficient than the one it inherits from abstract name. That is different with the other implementation class string name, which may not want to um, override this particular method because what its own implementation could be or would be uh, may or may not be uh, equally inefficient. Actually, it's a bit more efficient, but it's not nearly as easily done as for string array name. So to come out to so finding a good inheritance interface is uh, is not easy. Um, needs experience, so you've got to practice it. Uh, it helps to think through class hierarchies in both directions, um, bottom up and top down. These are really the two different ways of how reuse uh, happens here and how you move code around to avoid redundancy in code and want uh, to make it clean and good looking. So one is uh, bottom up thinking. Uh, in that case, usually the subclass adds new functionality. And for that, imp the implementation of this new functionality, it uses the methods it inherits from a superclass. So the superclass is really just this reservoir of useful methods for the new functionality, almost like a library. The other way of thinking is top-down, where a class makes promises to use clients about functions, functionality it has, and then thinks about how to implement it all the way to primitive methods, and sometimes to the final end, but sometimes also in such a way that the abstract class or the class says, well, I want to leave it open to subclasses to customize certain things here. And that's what you use the inheritance interface for, and the primitive methods in the inheritance interface. So then, on the abstract superclass level, you get the algorithms, the overall structure, the skeleton, the scaffolding, and you leave open the small bits and pieces uh, for subclasses to fill in, to fill in. So you think you have to think class hierarchies both ways, top down and bottom up and both perspectives are valid. This corresponds with what's been called the open-close principle. Um, you should design a class in such a way that uh, it can be extended without breaking its semantics. You come to, to uh, design by contract and the meaning of, uh, of methods, and methods calls and interfaces later in another class. A uh, class should be open for extension but you should not allow to modify promised behavior uh, to client. Um, I mention it 
this principle because it's often used so you will find it in the literature i find it somewhat vague i clearly prefer what we will spend a whole lecture on uh, design by contract and the liskov substitutable principle uh, in place of these uh, rules of thumb all right some interface quiz for you so the methods of your class or interface are spread around and you want things to be more readable oh so how should you structure your class interface should you go by type so all the getters in one place all the setters in another all the boolean queries here all the assertion methods there should you or alternatively, should you use visibility or the public methods here or the protected methods there? Should you go by some method purpose, by client needs? What do you think? So my answer is indeed, um, all of these are somewhat valid uh, answers, but some are more important than others. So for example, I would go by client needs first. So there is the use client interface and it's separate from the inheritance client interface. So these are two large, the two large section of a class implementation where you put methods either into one or the other section, for example. Within that section, you may go by the um, concerns of uh, the class, the roles, as we will learn later. So you group all methods uh, through which a uh, client has a particular perspective on the object like oh this is used for um, registering interest and state changes and this is used for triggering algorithmic computations so these are the different roles or concerns and within that you have your uh, individual methods of very different types and so forth second question here where to the implementation fields or do the implementation fields of your class go Mm, good one so you write your class where do you put the state the fields above the methods below the methods next to the method doesn't matter this is a tricky question because well think for a second because um there are no perfect answers here because there's quite the conflict between different needs. The convention with most programmers is, and maybe that's what you should stick with, is to put the implementation fields at the top of the class. Um, nearly everyone does it, and because everyone expects it, that's perhaps the best solution. I could also argue that they're really not so important because you want to see the interface first, so you could put them to the end where nobody sees them so quickly. You could also argue that some implementation fields are really only relevant for different concerns or protocols, so you could spread out the different implementation fields and put them into the different roles or concerns near to the methods that work with them. Um, realistically, I think sticking with above the methods at the start of the class simply by the power of convention is the best idea. All right, how do you evolve classes? It's already been implicit in what I discussed so far that there are obviously different structures of how to design your classes and that they fulfill perhaps different needs. So I emphasized how you should not over design and if a simple class that is its own complete module does the job, then that's great. It has the interface, it has the implementation state, it has the methods to implement the interface face based on the implementation state. In the interface, you have the abstract state. Everything's there in one unit. Great, because then it's easier to understand. It's not so great if you want to introduce variation because subclasses of a simple class um, will 
be hard to design well if the simple class has not been prepared for such subclassing. That's then where the others, the whole set of issues that I discussed today comes into play. Uh, pulling out an interface to separate it from an implementation, um, separating what is abstract or general from primitive implementations internally, internal methods, internal interfaces, and ultimately turning those primitive methods into an inheritance interface so that the abstract super, so that the class implementing an interface can be turned into an abstract superclass where subclasses fill in the holes or the gaps defined by the abstract superclass. These concrete subclasses then are the implementation classes. Um, there's a natural evolution of how you make go from a simple class uh, through steps like those that I just explained. And let me uh, illustrate that, that here. So you start out with the simple class, but maybe that is not good enough because you see the need for sometimes you need a very memory efficient version and sometimes you need a very speedy manipulation uh, of the components so you know you want to prepare for allowing for variation. So if you know that there will be variation then you need know you need different implementation classes and to make that possible you need to pull out the interface. And hence, in Java or other programming languages, you simply declare an interface independently of the name class. It actually usually gets the original name called name here, while the remaining implementation class then becomes simple name here. And simple name still implicitly has the full interface, but now you also made it explicit by its own compilation unit, the uh, interface called name here. And then the simple name class simply implements the interface and that's it. If you want to use a homogeneous name, you instantiate the simple name class and you can use it through the name interface or directly through the implied simple name class interface. Of course, knowing that you want to go for variation, you should not use the simple name class directly, but uh, past instantiation of objects where you need to name a concrete class, you just work through the name interface. So that then allows you to introduce different implementation classes of the interface. So no abstract superclass yet. Um, you realize you have that interface, it does what the use client wants, but the use clients or your program wants these two variations, the speedy one and the memory efficient one. So now you can implement two different classes uh, that implement the name interface called string name and string array name, the classes we already know. As defined here, they are, they are their own complete implementations of the name interface, which is fine. Uh, at the client now says in the beginning, oh, I need a memory efficient um, uh, homogeneous name object, so let's choose string name. And later they say, oh, I really need, need a speedy one, so let's instantiate the string array name class. But both objects are only used through the name interface interchangeably. Now, as you do that, or as you implement these two classes, you obviously recognize a lot of redundancy. So the string name class and the string array name class without a shared abstract superclass will just redundantly repeat a lot of code, which is why you should have that abstract name class pretty quickly. It's still good to start with direct implementations because that's the most direct way to have something working. But as you recognize the redundancy, as you see, maybe this needs to be evolved further. It is a good design idea to introduce that abstract superclass. This leads you to the structure uh, displayed here. Uh, there's the name interface, still the only thing past object instantiation. 
that the client sees, that a use client sees. It has the full blown interface for the use client interface. Great. But now you extract it from the two implementation classes of the name interface. You extract it from string name and string array name, an abstract superclass that has most of the algorithms of these super, uh, shared by these subclasses, but also has that inheritance interface that consists of primitives that the algorithms in the abstract name class use for the implementation through which they delegate the completion of the class to subclasses. Completion means, first of all, implementation state. The abstract name class in this example and also often in other situations has no fields because that's something you want to leave to subclasses. Some of the most heavyweight decisions are to add fields to classes uh, so that the objects get heavyweight. So you really want to delay that down the inheritance tree as far as you can. So you leave it to the subclasses to have fields and group the minimal amount of primitive methods around it to fulfill the from the inheritance interface to fulfill the inheritance interface where it's abstract and leaves things open so that by instantiating then so that the subclass then becomes a concrete implementation class and can be instantiated. So in addition to the name attribute and string name and the components string array and string array name, you will have some primitive methods there, but a minimal set uh, if you have a good narrow inheritance interface and abstract name and that completes the abstract name class in two different ways. With that, you have the full-blown design of an interface and an abstract class and in the example, two implementation classes. Could be more, of course. So finally, I want to quickly talk about how classes which I introduced as either being derived from modeling or for technology purposes are really um, also um, a tactic, technical vehicle, right? So yes, again, but it's not this course. When describing systems, first and foremost, you want to model your problem domain, right? But in the implementation dealing with technology, there will be simply all kinds of idioms and technical tricks that you need to master. And here are special purpose uses of classes that let you do some of that. So the basic stuff we covered today, you have simple classes which do it all. You have the interfaces which are really just the methods and the abstract state. Um, you have implementation classes, concrete classes, which you can instantiate. Um, you have abstract superclasses, which are a skeleton or a scaffolding for subclasses to make it easy to get to a new subclass or to new implementation classes. I didn't mention that so much that uh, often if you have multiple implementation classes, you want to mark one as the default choice because someone who wants to use your classes doesn't necessarily uh, know which one to pick um, and if they have no specific requirements they are not really interested in reading up on the details of all of them so mark one class as default or simple or something and then users of your framework or library are good to go. Beyond these general purpose classes there are other aspects of using classes that I should quite quickly want to mention. For example, in Java, there are tagging interfaces. If you, so you may have recognized sometimes there are interfaces that have no method. So there's no state space. So what's the point? Uh, still, uh, classes implement them. And it's like a tag being added to the class, a tag which says, um, something will hold true. This is a serializable class. This class can be uh, written to disk. There's a serialization format. So it's an indicator of system provided or system required functionality that then also should be there. 
from a design perspective that's not so great because anything that's implicit and not explicit is not good you always want to see things explicitly you don't want to run into runtime failures you want to on the compiler to catch stuff but sometimes you can't help it and you have these tagging interfaces another style of using classes and interfaces to use interfaces or classes for mixing in functionality it's a composition approach to building classes from building blocks usually you need multiple inheritance you also can do it with delegation with different incomplete classes focus on one aspect for example one role or one collaboration that an object would play and you mix multiple of those together to create the resulting final implementation class um, sometimes you name classes by the purpose they play for example the design patterns which we will also talk about later so that's it uh, for today we talked about classes and interfaces about the key distinction of modeling i want to drive home focus on your problem domain first but then once you've got that down this session will come into play how to structure your classes and interfaces how to write better code by way of this clear understanding of what's the purpose of an interface an abstract superclass which has an inheritance interface and concrete implementation classes that fulfill the inheritance interface to give users concrete classes that can be instantiated of which the objects can be used by using objects designed by primitives and the inheritance interface are key building blocks of doing it right and so is the narrow inheritance interface principle in the end this is if you hear it for the first time a lot so as you design your own system systems take it in steps um, start with a simple solution and don't be afraid to change your code and evolve it over time never be afraid to change your code with that thank you very much for your time and attention and see you next week